In this video, we're going to machine this vintage kind of 50s diner style drawer handle for an old steel top table my girlfriend's repainting for her father. It's been sitting in the corner of a garage for the last decade, and with his birthday around the corner, we decided it's time to give it a facelift. She sandblasted and painted all the rusty brackets and given it a fresh coat of bright red paint. And our job is to come up with a new drawer handle to replace this old knob. The machining's all done on this converted Precision Matthews PM30 bench mill, and we're running it with a Centroid Acorn controller. I took some inspiration from the old Chevy logo, and it's a pretty simple little thing, but there's sort of a catch. It isn't square, so there's no way to hold it in a vise, and so in this video I'm going to show my favorite way of dealing with this problem, which is using a fixture plate. So let's quickly talk about the machining strategy. It's going to start out as an aluminum block, which is represented by that yellow box around the model. And for the record, this stock should be way smaller, but I just so happen to have some inch and a half by two inch aluminum bar on hand, so that's what we're going to use. And this bar is real easy to hold in a vise, so that's exactly what we'll do. We'll grip the bottom of the stock and start machining the part from the bottom. And so once we've machined everything we possibly can from this side, we've got to flip it over and machine the top. And this is where we run into that problem. How are we going to hold this thing? Well, this is where we'll use the fixture plate. If we have a fixture plate and bolt this thing to it, we should be able to hold the fixture plate in the vise and finish machining from the top. But there's one more small problem, and it's locating the part. The CNC machine will always run exactly the toolpath you tell it to. But if the part you're trying to machine is sitting crooked or out of position, the perfect toolpath is going to come out looking crooked on the part. So to make sure the part's sitting perfectly square on the fixture plate, we're going to use these dowel pins that fit into dowel holes with a very tight fit. In this case, the holes are only going to be one thousandth of an inch larger than the dowel pins. Some of you might be thinking, well, why don't we just use the bolts to locate the part? That would let us skip using the dowels altogether. And the short answer is that using the bolts to locate isn't accurate enough. The clearance holes for the bolts on the fixture plate are 20 thousandths larger than the bolt, so whatever we machine could potentially be up to 20 thousandths crooked or out of position. And you know in a lot of cases that might be just fine, but in this case the chamfer we're going to put on the handle all around the part in the second operation is going to be 40 thousandths of an inch wide. So if the part's crooked, the chamfer can vary in size by up to 50% all around the part, which is going to be really noticeable. Alright, I hope I made some sense there, so let's put the stock in the vise and use the probe to show the control where it's located in space. In the CAM program, the origin that all the tool paths are located with respect to is on the top dead center of the stock. It's represented by that little XYZ triad, and that's where the probe is touching now. So by setting X, Y, and Z to zero in the control when the probe is touching this point, we've told the CNC machine where to run the toolpaths in space. So the first operation is to deck the part off, removing all that excess material. We're doing it with the Tormach Superfly because it removes material faster than any other tool I have, and it leaves a great finish. I'll share the feeds and speeds here for anybody interested. This is a 100,000 step down, and you can actually push it harder. I've done up to 250 thousandths with the same feeds, but it's a little scary, so I usually stick to something like this, or maybe 150 thousandths. The next operation will be to cut out the shape with a 3 8 3 fluid aluminum end mill at 3 8 depth, 80 thousand step over, and 2.5 thousandths feed per tooth at 3,000 RPM. This results in a linear speed of 22.5 inches per minute. Again, you can push it harder than this, but I found the limit to be at about 150 thousandths step over. I did a test where at 150,000 step over and half an inch step down, which is more than we're running here, I hit a few limits with this tool. The stock 2 horsepower brushless DC spindle motor started bogging down and wasn't able to hold at 3000 RPM. It would sit at around 2200. And I also started getting some tool pullout. If you held the tool in an R8 collet instead of this TTS collet tool holder, you'd probably resolve the pullout problem, but not the motor bogging issue. In CAM, we left a small ten thousandths of an inch skin of material all around the part. So after the roughing, this end mill will come around to clean it up. It's got an effective cutting length of one inch, and the part is 0.9 inches tall, so we can hit it at full depth to clean up the perimeter with a 2D contour operation. We're going slow here for the nicest possible finish, but you don't want to go much slower than this. I found that running at less than one thou feed per tooth can actually result in a poorer surface finish, especially in aluminum. Next, we spot drill the mounting holes and put a chamfer all around the part with the same tool, a two flute 90 degree chamfer mill. In harder materials, you should spot drill with something that has a wider angle than the drill itself, but in aluminum, I find it doesn't really matter so much. Next, we come in with a drill and put in some 5mm holes that we'll tap with M6 threads next. Here's the part that's a little hacky. If I want to use a tap to thread a hole, this is how I've got to do it. I use the CNC control to park the tap right over the hole, but then I use the quill to manually plunge the tool into the hole and let it pull itself into the part. 
turning the spindle off manually before the top explodes, so there's plenty room for things to go wrong here. I'll then manually turn the spindle to get to the bottom of the hole, then reverse the spindle to pull the tap out. The alternative is thread milling, which is done with full CNC control, but sadly I've become pretty used to this method and use it pretty often, in aluminum anyway. For the last operation in the first setup, we put the 3 16th inch dowel holes in with a 2 flute 1 8 inch aluminum end mill in an interpolated helical boring operation. These are the holes that are going to fit snugly around the dowels to locate the part accurately for the second setup. Before taking the part out of the vise, which would cause us to lose our position, I like to check the holes by threading in a bolt and testing the dowel fits to make sure the pins go in but aren't too loose. If the holes are too tight, we can increase their size slowly until we're happy, but if they're too sloppy, we might have to scrap the part and start over, so it's a good idea to take some care here. Let's take the part out of the vise. And so far, it's looking pretty good. We'll put the dowel pins into the fixture plate so we can accurately mount the work to it and bolt everything down. I like to sometimes leave little notes on the fixture plate that remind me how I had a position when I was machining in the critical features, so in this case those are the dowel holes. I do this because I like to machine the part in the same orientation just for the most consistency. We'll load everything into the vise and probe it into position. What I should be doing here is probing the fixture plate, not the raw stock like you see me doing. The only reason I'm probing the stock is because the fixture plate is actually smaller than it and I have no real way of getting to the fixture plate, so I'm going to just face it here and then I'm going to reprobe it to put the chamfer on. If I was making a bunch of these, I'd have the fixture plate wider than the stock, but because I was only really making one, I was kind of trying to save material and make the fixture plate as small as possible. With the part probed in, we start skimming all the excess material off the top of the handle with the Tormach Superfly. We're removing material in smaller step-downs here because the part's a little less rigid, held with only two bolts instead of the full force of the vise. Truth is, we probably didn't have to, but that was the thinking here. With that done, now we can reprobe, touching off on accurate machine surfaces of the fixture plate to get a more accurate position for the next operation, which is going to be putting a chamfer all around the part. And it turns out I didn't record the chamfering, but you can see that it looks perfect. And the only reason it does is because we took the time to make sure we had everything perfectly positioned by using the fixture plate and dowel pins. When you need accurate features after flipping the part, this fixture plate dowel pin method is the best I've found. Even when the part is square and you have the option of holding it in a vise after you flip it, I'd still use the fixture plate dowel pin method if accuracy is important to you. There are a few downsides, namely the extra time and material you need to make the fixture plate, but it works so well. And it works in almost every scenario. Even when the design doesn't conveniently have threaded and dowel holes in it like we had here, you can always place those features off the part and cut them off in the second operation, leaving tabs to support the part before breaking it out. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video.